can't sleep because of the disgusting noise you're making. If you want to throw up, do it outside. Oh, wait. My mother in law roughly pulled my arm and dragged me down the hallway. Then she pushed me out of the front door with all her might. I knew that no matter what happened to me, I had to protect my baby in my belly. I rushed to put my hands on the ground before I fell on my stomach. It was still snowing outside and freezing to the point my ears hurt right away. I wanted to go back inside immediately, but my mother in law looked down at me grimacing like a devil. You're just being lazy, taking such a long maternity leave. Regardless of my condition, I worked, gave birth, and raised Jake. Your weakness has no excuse. I'm sorry, John. Please let me go back inside. Otherwise, my baby. Shut up. A weak mother can only give birth to a weak child. You will reflect on that and toughen up outside. She slammed the door shut mercilessly. The sound of the boat echoed harshly in the cold air, and I realized that I had to stay out for the night. The tears on my cheeks quickly turned icy cold. Jake and I met in college. Although we were in different majors, we hit it off at the photography club we joined. We started dating shortly after we met and got married. We both have a job, but I'm on maternity leave right now. Right after starting my leave, I was well and surprisingly energetic. I thought I was able to study for a certification, but I was naive. Now I'm not so stable and can't even do the chores properly. I was working hard at the full time job before, so I'm sometimes disappointed in myself for being weak. Jack's been my number one supporter ever since my condition changed. He's been coming home on time almost every day. When I'm feeling down, he tells me, Carrying a child is a hard work, so don't be hard on yourself. You just need to focus on having a healthy baby. He always encourages me. I've heard that some women are disappointed in their husband after they get pregnant. I'm the complete opposite, and I'm really happy to have married him. Then one day, sorry, I have to go on an overnight business trip. It's something I can't refuse. Don't worry about it. I can manage for two days. To be honest, I'm worried. My condition's been up and down so much recently that I haven't been able to sleep well even late at night. I've been able to manage my life somehow thanks to Jake's support. Even if I wanted to go back to my parents, I would have to fly to get there. It would be impractical to pay a lot of money for a flight for such a short stay. Jake seems to sense my uneasiness and gently puts my head into his chest. So I'm thinking, why don't you go and stay with my parents? Your parents? Their place isn't that far from here, and I'll feel safer if you're with them. I can't say yes to his suggestion right away because I'm not very fond of John, my mother in law. It was the first time I went to meet them upon our engagement. My first impression of my father in law was serious, and John was chatty. At one point, I went to the restroom. When I came out of the stall, she was just coming in. I smiled at her. And she rolled her eyes in return. As I was stunned, not knowing what had happened, she sighed in annoyance. I don't get what's so good about a plain girl like you. He doesn't have an eye for women. I remember only a little of what happened after that. When I realized it, it was all over. 
and I was back home with Jake. I couldn't talk to him about it and have kept it inside of me. She must have said it because she thought that I was taking her only son away from her. After that, whenever we've been alone, she continues to make sarcastic remarks to me. No other harm has been done so far, and both my father in law and Jake are always amazing to me. I've been telling myself to just put up with it, but I'm worried what would happen if we stayed under the same roof. When I remain silent, Jake looks into my face. Don't worry about my parents. We are family now, and it's only for two days. I'll try to finish my work quickly and come back as soon as I can. I take a deep breath knowing that refusal was not an option. Yeah, okay, I'll stay with them. I'll drive you there the day after tomorrow. He walks into the kitchen to wash the dishes. Although anxious, I think about my baby and tell myself it's better than being alone. The day of Jake's business trip has arrived, and he drives me to his parents in the morning. It's about an hour's drive from our house. They live close to the mountains, and there's still a lot of snow on the ground. I spot a few people shoveling snow here and there. Soon, a large house with a red roof came into view. My father in law David is waving at the porch. Next to him, John stands looking indifferent. Hi, Sheila. Long time no see. Yes, it's been a while. I'm sorry for burging in on you so suddenly. No problem at all. Where's your bag? Here, please look after her. Wait, come in and have a coffee with us. I have a train to catch. Honey, I'll call you later. Jack gives me a peck on my lips and gets in his car and drives away. It's the usual gesture, but the look I get from John is ice cold. It's the worst possible start, but I have to get through it anyway. With a sinking feeling, I follow David and enter the house. Immediately, a wave of nausea came over me. I feel so sick that my head starts spinning. However, John's spiteful look and piercing eyes feel more painful to me. I should at least help her with some housework to put her in a better mood. John, can I help you with cleaning the house? Showing no appreciation, she hands me, or more like throws the vacuum cleaner to me. I start right away, but it's not going well. It sucks up the rug, doesn't go all the way to the corner, and to top it all off, it hits the shelf. A picture frame on the shelf falls to the floor. It's a picture of Joan and Jake. When she notices this, she raises her eyebrows. Ah, you're so clumsy. Can't you even vacuum properly? I'm sorry. Stop it, John. She's pregnant. Whatever. I was able to do things when I was like her. Seeing her storm out of the room, David scratches his head. I'm sorry, Sheila. I'll talk to her later. Anyway, you should take a break. I've made your room. Thank you. He shows me to the guest room on the first floor. The bed is nicely made with a thick and fluffy cover on top, and there are many pillows. He must have prepared the room for me on the first floor out of concern of my condition. I thank him, who tells me he's going to shovel the snow and gratefully crawl under the covers. As I doze off in the warmth, the door cracks open a little without a noise. I see a pair of glaring eyes peering through it. It's John. Slacker, being lazy just because you're pregnant. 
Excuse me? It's much harder after the baby is born. You haven't even gone through the labor and are already acting like it's too much to handle. Her condescending tone is getting on my nerves. I manage to get myself up and walk toward her. I can do housework too. Without saying a word, she hands me a piece of cloth. Then she points to the hallway. She wants me to clean the floor. I know that doing such a thing with my current body would be quite a burden, but I have no choice. At first, I manage it with a bit of enthusiasm and desperation, but then it starts to get harder and harder. I slip and almost fall flat on my stomach, but I hold myself back with my hands. I really don't want to cause any stress to the baby. In the meantime, the nausea returns and I rush to the bathroom. As I curl up holding the toilet bowl, I hear John's voice. You useless. I'd rather you sleep than make a mess in my house. She disappears into the living room. I can't say or do anything so I crawl back into my room. I shrink under the cover and try not to think about anything. Eventually, I fell asleep. It's the middle of the night. I wake up feeling nauseous and cover in the bathroom. David had left a sandwich and some tea in a thermo for me, but I can't even look at them. I gag and gag, but nothing comes out. Bitter saliva mixed with gastric acid spreads in my mouth, which only adds to the sick feeling. I'm crying and waiting for it to subside. Then I hear a heavy sound, like someone stamping down the stairs. The door to the bathroom, which I forgot to lock, opens suddenly. I can't sleep because of the disgusting noise you're making. If you want to throw up, do it outside. Oh wait. John roughly pulls my arm and drags me down the hallway. Then she pushes me out of the front door with all her might. I knew that no matter what happened to me, I had to protect my baby in my belly. I rush to put my hands on the ground before I fall on my stomach. It's still snowing outside and freezing to the point my ears hurt right away. I want to go back inside immediately, but Joe looked down at me grimacing like a devil. You're just being lazy, taking such a long maternity leave. Regardless of my condition, I worked, gave birth, and raised Jake. Your weakness has no excuse. I'm sorry, John. Please let me go back inside. Otherwise, my baby. Shut up. A weak mother can only give birth to a weak child. You will reflect on that and toughen up outside. She slams the door shut mercilessly. The sound of the boat echoes harshly in the cold air. And I realize that I have to stay out for the night. The tears on my cheeks quickly turn icy cold. I think about where to get help, but I know it would be dangerous to walk around the unfamiliar place. It's pitch dark without many lights too. I sit down on the porch for now. I've been vomiting so much that I barely have energy left. I look around for something and see a storage shed in the corner of the yard. I manage to walk over to it and open the creaking door. Although it's cluttered inside, there's still enough space for me. As I sit, hugging my knees, my tears start rolling down again. I'm sheltered from the wind, but wonder if I would make it through the night. Even if I endure it, what would happen to our baby? As I sob, shivering in the cold, I hear the faint sound of a car in the distance. 
It's coming closer and closer and stops in front of the house. Thinking it might be Jake, I shout frantically, Jake, honey, help. Shira. Immediately the door opens and I see the stunned Jake. He immediately takes off his jacket and puts it over me. What are you doing here? Shira, Jake. I look up and see David running toward us in a panic. He's holding a flashlight in his hand. They take me inside the house and cover me with a thick blanket. David quickly prepares hot tea for me. My body is finally getting relaxed. But I can't stop thinking of John's face. Um, where's John? Don't worry about her. I'm sorry, I. It's okay. Jake hugs my shoulder tightly. This as she suddenly takes over me, knowing that I'm safe, and I faint. I'm awoken by the sunlight. I'm in a daze for a minute. Then the events of the night before gradually come back to me. Jake must have carried me after I passed out. I'm lying in bed. I open the guest room door with an uneasy feeling, wondering what happened after that. The first thing that jumps into my eyes is the sight of John sitting upright on the sofa. Good morning. Oh, did you sleep well? Yes, I did. Jake immediately comes next to me and gently hugs my shoulder. I sit down on the reclining chair as he urges me to do. John looks agitated. I scolded mom. I'm sorry, honey. I want to apologize to you too. I'm really sorry. It's okay now. But what about your business trip? I explain the situation to my boss and ask him to make it a one day trip. He had noticed my reluctance and had told David to call him immediately if anything happened. David had been somehow aware of John's attitude toward me and was watching us closely since I arrived. Seeing that John was trying to get me to do housework, he contacted Jake. When he received the call, he quickly made arrangements to leave on the same day. When David was awakened by a noise in the middle of the night, he came to check on me and found the guest room empty. He asked John, who was asleep, what had happened, and she casually told him that I had gone out for a walk. He went outside in a panic to look for me. I'm really sorry, honey. If I had been more careful. You're overreacting. You still talk like that? What is your problem? Stop it, mom. If you don't show remorse, I'll go to the police. That's right. What you've done is a crime. I can't live with such a person anymore. Do you understand what I mean? As they scold her, John starts apologizing in tears. It must be painful to be blamed by her beloved husband and only son. I keep quiet as I rub my stomach. A few months later, we are visiting my in laws with our newborn daughter. David welcomes us with all smiles, and John stares awkwardly at us. In the end, they decided to remain together. She's given an ultimatum that if she causes another trouble for me or others in the future, he will divorce her without a question. He also told her that he will not support her financially. Jake told me with an indescribable expression on his face. Dad's also troubled about it. He says maybe the way he's been to her influenced her to take it out on you. He was a workaholic and didn't help out much with raising me. I see. But that doesn't mean she should have done that to you. I was also thoughtless. I thought that since we are now a family, everything would be fine. 
I'm really sorry. He looked like he was about to cry, but it was not his fault at all. He made that decision because he cared about me and trusted his parents. Besides, both David and he were sorry for what happened and sincerely apologized to me. I had no reason whatsoever to blame them. Although I've been visiting my in laws several times since my daughter was born, John keeps looking at me with frightened eyes. I guess she's afraid to do something wrong, which will change her life completely. What she said to me makes me think that she might have been abused by someone while she was pregnant. Still, as Jack said, it is not a reason to do the same to others. Rather, because she had a bad experience, she needs to break the negative chain of events. We have to have that kind of mindset. Although it was a really difficult event, I've learned a lot as a person and as a parent. I stand up to show John, my daughter, who's happily smiling.